Hey everybody, it's Will here. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode of the Blockware Intelligence YouTube channel. Today, we're gonna to be continuing with our on-chain analysis tutorial series. Today, talking about illiquid supply for episode four. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, you'll probably notice that I haven't done any videos over the last week. The reason is because I've had COVID and I've actually been pretty sick. I'm feeling better and I'm now excited to get these videos back out on a regular credence for you guys. Second thing is that you'll notice I've removed my camera. So one of the big complaints I saw over the last couple of videos was that you were saying that the camera was actually blocking some of the charts in the upper right hand uh, side of the screen. I tried to move it to the upper left hand side and screen recorded it with it there, but it still played back with it in the upper right hand side. So I decided just to remove it altogether for this video. But if anyone knows how to fix that, let me know. Uh, and last thing is, uh, would really appreciate if you could like and subscribe, just kind of help pump this content out to the algorithms. And uh, let me know any other metrics you'd like to see me cover moving forward. Uh, supply liquidity is one of the ones I saw requested most often. So. All right, let's go ahead and dive in and talk about supply liquidity. What does this mean? Uh, so essentially, this is telling you where supply is moving based on the spending behavior of all the different entities on the blockchain. So previously, we've talked about what is an entity. An entity is a forensically clustered address based on the data science that the Glassnode team has done. So to understand this, we need to understand the three different cohorts that make up supply liquidity. So first of all, we have highly liquid supply. This is defined as supply held by entities that hold less than 25% of the coins they take in. So for every four, every four coins they take in, they hold less than one. Or for every four coins they take in, they spend more than three, either way you want to look at it. Uh, these entities are most likely market makers or just traders that are in and out of the market all day. Second, we have liquid supply. This is defined as supply held by entities that hold over 25% of the coins they take in but less than 75% of the coins they take in. So these are probably your kind of your intermediate term traders, right? And then third, we have illiquid supply. Illiquid supply is defined as supply held by entities that hold over 75% of the coins they take in. So for every four coins they take in, they hold more than three of those. And so these entities are kind of the long-term investors, the kind of strong hands in the market, if you will. Next up, we're looking at liquidity classification. So in the first video, we talked about long-term holders and we talked about how there's 155 day kind of cutoff for that between short and long-term holders. And we talked about how there's a smoothing factor with this 20 day window between the 155 day threshold that you kind of have the smoothing factor from you know when an entity is coming from one cohort in and out of the other so that you don't just get these big outliers you know in the data when it, when it crosses over the threshold very similar thing here with uh liquidity uh with supply liquidity so you'll just see that this is telling you there's, there's essentially just the smoothing factor uh, of when supply is moving between the different cohorts based on when an entity spending behavior is being adjusted Okay, now we talked about some of the data science and what defines supply liquidity in the different cohorts that make up of it. Now we're going to look at some charts. So first of all, we have highly liquid supply. Again, these are entities that hold less than 75, I'm sorry, less than 25% of the coins that they take in. So again, these are most likely market makers or just traders that are in and out of the market all day. Next, we have liquid supply. These are entities, again, that hold over 25% of the coins they take in, but less than 75%. And third, this is looking at illiquid supply. So these are again, entities that hold over 75%. Uh, so what you'll see first of all is that there's this kind of like upwards drift, right? And so this is showing you that over time, more and more coins are locked up as we kind of have these entities that are coming in and just buying and holding their coins, as well as just coins that get lost and just are never moved again, especially in kind of the early days of Bitcoin's history. But of course, this is going to have an upward drift when there's more supply that gets issued every day. So to kind of combat this, we need to compare the two cohorts, right? So we need to compare illiquid to the liquid and highly liquid guys, which we'll talk about in a second. And this is just looking at all three, this kind of broader landscape. Okay, so now we're looking at the illiquid supply shock ratio. This is the metric that you'll always see me post on Twitter or talk about in the newsletter or on Pomp Show or whatever. Um, this is a metric that I created last summer with Willy Woo. And in essence, I wanted to kind of get a gauge of the movement of coins from weak to strong hands or from strong to weak hands. Um, and, and so the calculation for this is, again, we're looking at illiquid supply divided by 
highly liquid plus liquid supply. So in layman's terms, we're looking at the strong hands, which are the illiquid entities, divided by the weak hands, which are the highly liquid plus liquid entities. And so again, in essence, it's just showing you the movement of coins from weak to strong hands, or another way to look at it is it's giving you kind of the qualitative view of the float of Bitcoin. The kind of down draw of this metric is that it doesn't take demand into account. So of course, for a supply shock to take place, you need low available supply or low float plus demand. And so we'll look at this in a second. This is looking at illiquid supply shock ratio and kind of this broader landscape. So you'll see at the beginning of Bitcoin's history, we saw more and more supply becoming liquid, basically as Bitcoin became a highly speculative vehicle. This is really before Bitcoin kind of took off as a store of value. In 2017, we started to see this pick up as people took more custody of their coins. We saw custodians and exchanges come into the market as well. Once this uptrend was broken, you also see that this kind of marked the 2017 peak. So I drew this kind of dotted line to show that as soon as we broke below this uptrend, that marked that, that kind of reversal back into the bear market. Saw a decline all the way down into the bottom of the bear. We saw this kind of go flat all the way up until March of 2020. And this is where Bitcoin really took off as a store of value. And with that narrative kind of taking off as an inflation hedge, we started to see supply liquidity move more and more towards the illiquid entities especially into kind of this March, April time period of early 2021. We saw this major peak before this drawdown. And this was actually a leading indicator as we'll look at in a, in a second in a bit more zoomed in view here. Uh, but this declined for about a week or two before we saw this uh, drawdown in May. And since then, we've just seen this continuous, uh, you know, kind of uptrend uh, following the uptrend that began back in March of 2020. This is a bit more zoomed in version. So you'll see in 2017, we had these kind of two distinct peaks before starting to draw down. We talked about how once, uh, once a liquid supply broke this upward sloping trend line that marked the peak of 2017, drew down into the bottom of the bear. Once this started to bottom out, that marked that the Bitcoin market was starting to bottom out. We saw an increase again after March of 2020 and decline in the week or two before the May crash. A bullish divergence over summer 2021. This is one of the metrics that had me most, most bullish. And then finally, we saw this kind of supply shock effect kick in as we had 10 straight up days off of the lows as this bullish, di bull bullish divergence finally uh, kicked in. And then we had this massive kind of short, short squeeze uh, slash supply squeeze, whatever you'd like to call it here. Since then, we've just seen a liquid supply shock ratio continue to increase. You can see this little uh, uptick over the last couple of days, now reaching kind of this four-year high, the highest it's been since uh, 2017. So you'll, you'll notice as well that price has been in a decline over the last couple of months. And you'll say, well, you know, why, why is this bullish divergence not playing out? The reasoning is because, again, for a supply shock to take place, we need low available supply plus demand. So to me, what this is showing is that there's just no demand stepping in, even though you're seeing really strong hodling behavior. I think a lot of that lack of demand is just coming from macro uncertainty with the Fed talking about, you know, quantitative tightening. So in conclusion, highly liquid entities are defined as entities that take in and hold less than 25% of the coins they take in. Or another way to say it is that they sell more than 75% of the coins they take in. Liquid entities are defined as entities that hold more than 25% but less than 75% of the coins they take in. And illiquid entities hold over 75% of the coins they take in. Illiquid supply in essence, or the illiquid supply shock ratio, in essence shows you, shows you the movement of coins to and from weak to strong hands in quotations. Uh, and then last thing is that a down, the down draw of this metric is that it doesn't take demand into account. So again, we can have the illiquid supply shock ratio or liquid supply in general ticking up but without demand, it won't always translate to immediate uh, price, price appreciation, right? I guess what the kind of key takeaway here is that you have strong hodling behavior. So once demand does step in, you will see major price appreciation because the quality of Bitcoin's float is so strong right now. You have a lot of Bitcoin's float held by entities that are not likely to sell those coins statistically. So once the demand steps in, you will probably start to see pretty aggressive price appreciation. But I think at the moment, again, a lot of that has to do with kind of the monetary tightening uncertainty that's kind of surrounding uh, both the Bitcoin and, and traditional markets. 
So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch this video. Hope you got something out of it. Uh, again, let me know any other metrics you'd like to see uh, covered moving forward. And uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time. Hope you have a great day. Take it easy. Bye-bye.